It's time for the Die Worm Weekly Roundup with my curated news and personal gaming endeavors. Are you enjoying these? Consider subscribing. Path of Exile announced their new league, Delirium. This league features another realm, the Delirium, which you can access using a portal in the maps. You can also influence maps itself with Delirium shards to increase the effects, which is pretty cool and gives an entire new dimension to the recently overhauled Atlas. This combined with Awakening Level 8, which I'm assuming still exists, the regular juicing of maps, scarabs, and now Delirium should result in some truly insane maps which require some truly broken builds to complete. The cherry on top in this league is access to roughly 200 more passive nodes, as if the game didn't feature enough of those. The cool thing about this new change is that you can craft gems which expand the existing passive tree, granting access to more nodes. A really original idea and I'm excited about this league. I played Conquerors of the Atlas quite a bit, killed Cirrus at Awakening Level 8, really did a ton of content in PoE and this new league got me once again excited. Good stuff. It launches March 13th, 2020. Walton tried to fix their game. Some of the major exploits like magic find and gold and item duplication seem to have been resolved. The damage has been done, however. Another feature got deleted. You can no longer change unique items to legendary ones using crafting. This had to do with the black market town upgrade permanently destroying people's games after using it. The devs will redesign it and then maybe re-enable it. Here are some other notable Walton changes. Bleeding Edge got nerfed to the ground. It was a powerful skill. Too powerful, to be sure, but these changes seem to be overcompensating. Summoning skills on the other hand got buffed, which is nice because they were rather weak. It is also nice because I'm playing a summoner. Health, damage and AI of summoned creatures generally got increased, especially at low levels, and these fixes are a nice change I feel. However, they're not enough, because now that I've reached endgame, it really takes my zombies ages to kill their targets and I can't seem to find a reliable way to buff them or do damage, apart from the passive skills I already invested in. Overall, it feels like the devs are working hard on fixing the game. That's good to see. Unfortunately, the more I play Walton, the more frustrated I get, but I'll cover that in a bit. Some other games first. Grim Dawn released a new patch. Some features include monster totems, which are basically shrines without a constellation point reward, but with a bunch of loot. Specific legendary weapons that are added in this patch are more likely to drop from these monster totems. There are four new monster infrequent medals for some of the endgame bosses. The patch features optimization improvements and some loot filter changes. And there is much more being added in this patch. There's an entire list I will link down in the description below. Kill Squad released their Genesis update, and I played it for a few hours. I thought it was actually released last week, like I said in that roundup, but it didn't. My bad. It is out now, however, and it is pretty good for new players at least. The update gives you some sort of email inbox which functions as a quest log and it basically tells you what to do and explains the game that way to new people who are doing the recruit league. And it works really well to be honest. Matchmaking is possible and I had no issues finding some buddies online. The missions feel a lot more varied with some bosses, new environments and overall much more attention to detail. Especially for newcomers, this is an excellent time to get into Kill Squad. I would however recommend playing with at least one friend, because this game shines in co-op play. I played Zero a lot, the healer of the bunch, and it is just fun keeping your buddies alive. Playing this game solo isn't all that great. Torchlight 3 shed some light on their future development. Every week they release a so-called mainline patch, which is practically impossible to read due to the fact that every line begins with some Trello code or something. I mean, that is super useful if you're part of the developer team, but if you're not, you know, like 99.9% .9 of all people reading this, it's kind of distracting. Is anyone actually tracking these issues that is not employed by Torchlight? If so, you better apply to be a scrum master over there. Pretty fun job actually. So we're not reading that because we can't, instead we're reading an article article written in proper English by Tyler Thompson, Torchlight 3 project lead. He talks about some areas of feedback. Before we start, I can't show any of my own footage because there is an NDA in place. So I'll just show their own fun day streams, where the devs play the game. Community feedback, according to Tyler, comes mainly on three topics. Skill progression, field of combat and harvesting. Up first, skill progression. It is kinda lackluster, it doesn't really feel good. Investing points in skills is sort of worthless and that is a problem in an action RPG. So they're going to implement something that Torchlight 2 had, which was some big skill boosts at level 4, 8 and 12. More details aren't really available and we will just have to see how this works over multiple patches. Then the feel of combat. The main issue with combat is that it feels a bit sluggish. The devs will do what normally happens in cases like this and that is fiddle around with the timing of animations and the moment of impact. The last epoch recently did an overhaul like this and it really improved the game combat a lot. Torchlight 3 will do something 
similar, basically reworking animation times so damage is dished out faster and animation locking is reduced. In my personal opinion, animation locking should basically not exist unless there is a really, really good reason for it. Like channeling some sort of a lightning storm from the sky into a single ray beam into your opponent. That is impressive enough already, you really shouldn't be moving at the same time. But any other skill, just don't use animation locking because it messes up the flow of combat and that is exactly what makes these games so appealing. There is really no reason why I shouldn't be able to fire a shotgun and walk at the same time. Last, harvesting. Guys, it takes ages, cutting down a tree, it feels like 6 seconds. They promise to make it feel good by giving a bonus after you harvest it like movement speed and by reducing the nodes. They could also just make the channeling time for harvesting like 0.5 seconds and I think everyone would be happy and no development capacity needs to be spent on this, but fine. I keep track of the game and I'll occasionally play it too. Out of all the games I'm covering and just playing, Torchlight 3 is really not high on the list. It's still very much Torchlight Frontiers using the same mechanics and being the same game and I'm just not very interested in it right now. I hope that they will gravitate to watch the original Torchlight games more and more because those were amazing games and I hope the devs are able to see that. Noita has Steam Workshop support right now. Noita is a fantastic cute little indie game, it's truly amazing, you should get it. Now Noita already had mod support but it was a bit of a hassle to get this running. You'd have to go to a web page, do some manual installations, you kind of need to know what you're doing. It's nothing new to a modding veteran like me because I used to mod the hell out of Skyrim but to others who are maybe more into indie games and not so much into modding, I can imagine you may not want to tamper with game files and that sort of thing. And in the end there are easier ways to mod, like with the Steam Workshop. And that is exactly what has happened. Super good news! Modding is now so easy and this game really has some amazing mods already, with a good number being added each week. Yet another reason to get this game. Some personal updates. I've been playing more Voltsen and I'm getting more and more frustrated with that game like I said. I really want to like it, but it makes it so hard. The sluggish combat, the animation locking that even prevents me from using a bloody potion, which caused me so many deaths. The numerous bugs that had me replay segments multiple times and even completely bugged the final fight. It is such a shit show actually that it kept me from finishing the campaign for more than a week because the fight is bugged out at the end. I keep playing Voltsen but the game is just not in a good state right now. They added way too much stuff and didn't realize there was no way in hell they could ever deliver quality on all that quantity. It is simply impossible in the time frame they set for themselves and now we ended up with a messy launch and a broken game. In terms of combat feel, balance, skill trees, progression bugs, boss fights. I mean I can talk for 10 minutes on the broken stuff I encountered, which I won't do. Fortunately, other developers managed to release finished or at least not completely broken products. Like Warlander, an indie action RPG from Serbia, available on Steam for 15 euros. Warlander is a mix between Dark Souls and Slay the Spire, if you can believe it. I think that these guys actually wanted to make a Star Wars lightsaber game, but they didn't have the license, so they invented some weird background story with forest gods, used that as an excuse to equip the protagonist with a lightsaber, and yeah, then this is what you get. And it actually works really well. You're this forest inspired character that starts out on the map. You can pick the nodes you want to travel, and every Every time a new node is selected, you enter a level. There you find a power up, some enemies to fight or a tree where you can buy upgrades. Those upgrades are well designed, they are meaningful, they are fun too. You can shoot spikes for example or lasso enemies from a platform, throw your weapon and upgrade multiple attacks. This way you become stronger as you make your way across the zones, but so do the enemies. The combat in this roguelike procedurally generated action RPG is really well done with some deep strategy involved. There are multiple enemies with different skills, some have armor, some use ranged attacks, some are super fast, others are super tanky, and the game is pretty tough as well. I've been playing for a few hours, did quite a few runs, but haven't managed to make it to the end just yet. I've been playing a bit of Wild Terra 2 New Lands. I did a bit of research, well, I entered Wild Terra in the search bar on Steam, because you know this is a sequel, but to what? Well, turns out there's a game called Wild Terra Online. It is free to play. The combined DLC available, however, costs more than 60 euros. It has a 60% mixed review rating and it is a sandbox MMORPG survival game from a top-down perspective. I'm personally not a great fan of the survival genre. I find surviving quite a hassle, actually, in games. And I like a story. 
but every now and then I want to check out some titles outside my comfort zone and this crossed my path. Part 2 that is, Wild Terra 2 New Lands. This game is currently in early alpha but the demo is playable until the beginning of March. See the sources in the video description for details and just to be clear I'm not sponsored, I've actually never been sponsored just so you know. So this alpha I played a bit of it and I have to say that this game strangely enough is very enjoyable and I can't entirely put my finger around it either. To start with, for an alpha game it doesn't look half bad. The sounds are not mixed correctly, music is absent, animations are a bit wonky, that's to be expected. The core gameplay loop however of gathering, crafting, using tools, getting better at things, starting to build stuff, actually build a small house and then a fence and then a workshop and then some clothes and then you hunt goats and you use their meat and you eat and you can just feel the progression and the gratification that this brings, which was unexpected. I've recently played something rather similar, Tribes of Midgard, which is also a top-down action RPG multiplayer survival game and that one couldn't really interest me at all because I really didn't feel the progression. This game, Wild Terra 2, despite being an early alpha, already feels a lot more polished in terms of the gameplay mechanics. I consider this a promising title. And that is all I have for you this week. Follow me on Twitter. Thanks so much for watching. I'll see you all next week. Love you all. Bye bye.